Good day, Redeemer Fellowship. Excited to be back with you guys for our midweek message as we explore the Apostles' Creed. And keep in mind, uh, the way that we're unpacking the Apostles' Creed is going to involve uh, a number of our other preachers and teachers. So be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you get the updates as we release this content every other week. Now, last week, we talked about the value of creeds and confessions in the Christian life and in the local church. But today, we're just entering into the Apostles' Creed. We're going to look at the very beginning of it, where it says, I believe. That's how it starts. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. But I want us to focus on the beginning phrase, I believe. I believe in God. In fact, that statement, I believe, runs throughout the Apostles' Creed. It's repeated a number of times because belief or faith is of the essence of being a Christian. You see, the, our understanding of faith is different from the popular concepts of faith. As Christians, we understand it is more than merely acknowledging that God exists. Most people that you'll meet in life would probably affirm that God exists. And if you ask them, do you believe in God? They might say, well, sure, I believe in God, which means for most people, I acknowledge that he is there. But acknowledgement is not the same thing as faith. Someone who says that they believe in God, but doesn't have dependency on God or any kind of relationship with God, doesn't really believe. There's a difference between agreeing with a fact or a proposition and knowing our maker. So that's what we're going to get. But to understand how this all works, I'd like us to look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Super popular passage. A lot of you know this passage. But walk with me as we look through it briefly to consider what it means to believe. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. I love this passage, and you probably do as well. But part of the reason I love it is because there is no embarrassment for the apostle to acknowledge that we are saved, that we need to be saved, that we are a people that, that require rescue. So let's consider that, that, that the apostle here pushes this idea, something that Christians and evangelicals and Bible thumpers uh, say quite a bit, you must be saved. Now, this idea is important because not only does it demonstrate that God is, is a God who does rescue, but perhaps even more importantly for many people, it pushes the idea of our own inability to save or to deliver ourselves. What does it mean to be saved? To save someone is to rescue them, to redeem them, to deliver them. And when we confess that we are saved by God's grace through faith, then what we're saying is, I cannot do this on my own. When the Bible speaks of us being saved, it, oftentimes the ransom redemption picture applies to things like sin. We're saved from sin. It's, it's consequence. It's curse. It's tyranny. Or from death. Right? We're saved from death and perishing. We're saved from hell itself. We are a helpless race as we stand before God. And what we need is God's mercy, God's kindness. You see, this makes our pride bristle, and it makes our theology bend, our understanding of God. We, we want to sometimes change what we believe because we don't like the idea that we are completely incapable of remaking ourselves. You see, in the kingdom of God, there is no self-made man. That person doesn't exist. You can't pull yourselves up by the bootstraps spiritually. There's no such thing as self-help spiritually, not before the Lord. We must be delivered. That's why it says we are saved by 
grace, saved by grace through faith. Our inability to save ourselves is connected not only to uh, the basic understanding of sin inside of us, but that even our best deeds, even our most righteous works themselves fall short of God's standard, are corrupt with sin. We cannot work our way out of our debt. You see, there's in Ephesians and in Galatians in particular, Paul goes to great lengths to explain that you cannot work off or pay off your debt. That will go on for eternity. There is no end in sight. You see, our works, our works righteousness is incapable of delivering us or saving us for two basic reasons. One, your good works today don't erase your wicked deeds of yesterday. You're still carrying the guilt of that. And your good works today are imperfect, marred and marked by sin. So even your best works bring sin with them, which in in turn brings more judgment. So listen again. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We all want to be justified. Every human being wants to be justified, right? To be recognized as right. To be received as righteous. Everybody wants that. The difference is most people in the world want to be justified by their own works on their own terms. We want to earn our status. But the Christian recognizes I cannot be justified by my own works. I cannot be declared righteous and cleansed of my sins by my own doing. I must look to Jesus Christ. And so, if we aren't careful as Christians, we will oftentimes begin to drift away from this grace-based faith received salvation and into a kind of works righteousness. Now we'll come back to that in just a minute. But Paul is pushing this really hard because he wants us to understand just how critical it is that we don't lose sight of who we are and how it is that we are what God now declares us to be. It is all of his grace. We are saved by grace through faith. So to say that it is by grace means that it is God's doing and it is God's kindness. You are not rescued because you were more worthy than another another person. This isn't even God saying women and children first, right? Like on the Titanic. Titanic is going down and people understood, let's get the women and children off first and the men can do their best to save themselves after. It was looking out for people who were in need. It was looking out for people who needed help and protection. So men and women were helped first. But it's not that you as a Christian were found to be more needy than another person who wasn't. You are saved by God's mercy, and undeserved favor. You don't deserve it. You don't earn it. And it is a mystery that God would save anyone. But he does save. In fact, he saves a number so great that no one can count it. Like the stars that fill the sky, God has chosen a people for himself. And so we are saved, rescued, redeemed, delivered by God's kindness to undeserving sinners. But we receive it through faith. Through faith. So faith is the means by which we actually receive God's grace and his salvation. And this is what I want us to consider. This is really the the main thing for us to hold on to as we consider what it means to truly believe, like it says in the Apostles' Creed. 
We are saved by grace through faith. What is faith, really? Now, faith is not what a lot of people consider um, a leap into the unknown. Faith is not the, the, uh, the optimistic hope that something is true or something is coming without any evidence that it is coming. That's not what faith is. Faith is not an uncertain affirmation about a vague deity. Faith is relying upon God's revelation. That's what it is. It is receiving God's revelation. See, we don't just believe that God is and we hope that that's true. God has revealed himself both in creation and in revelation in scripture. And his revelation of himself is what we tr- is what we believe, it's what we trust in, right? It, it is it is what tells us who God is. So we are relying upon his revelation, what he has said to be true. To believe in God or to have faith is not merely to believe in God, but to believe God to believe what he has said, to, to trust him. And that's the key word. Faith is more than a clear articulation of the faith, uh, of the faith, right, of, of what we believe. Faith is trust. So in the Reformed tradition, uh, we, we typically break down the concept of faith um, into three parts. There is knowledge, assent, and trust. So to have faith in something, right, you first must have some knowledge of it, right? You have to have some facts. You have to have some observations. Um, You you can't have faith in something if you don't know anything about that something. So the the illustration that we oftentimes use is to say, um, I could be walking through uh, a house that I'd never been in before, right? I could be walking through it, mostly empty. I walk into a room and I see what I believe is a chair, and I believe it's a chair because uh, I'm smart, right? I got the big brain. I see it's got four legs. It's got a back uh, to it. So it's not a stool. It's a chair, right? So four legs, seat, seat back to it. I recognize it as a chair. So I could say I believe that that's a chair or I know that that's a chair or I think that that's a chair. We can say it in different ways. But biblically, I don't yet have faith that that chair will support me if I sit in it. I don't need to have faith. I can look at it and go, okay, it's a chair. It's designed to hold weight. It could hold up my body weight if I were to sit on it. That's just knowledge. It's not yet true faith. I can look at it and say, it should hold me. It's designed to hold me. But faith goes beyond knowledge. Then there's a scent. The second part. Ascent is, I I, I agree that it will hold my weight. I actually, I know that it's supposed to. I know what its design is. Um, That's knowledge. Ascent says, if I sit in that thing, it won't collapse. It will support me. That's ascent. Agreement, right? It's, so I, I, not only do I recognize it for what it is, and now I agree that it would support me if I were to sit in it, but that's still not faith, because I'm not actually depending on the chair. The third part of faith is trust. And trust is when you actually put your butt on that chair and rest. Trust is of the essence of faith. Now, you can't have trust without knowledge and assent. But trust is really at the heart of it. It's when we rest upon Christ and his works. It's when we rest in all that Jesus has done for sinners, all of the promises of God in Christ. It's not just reading the Bible or having uh, a base of knowledge. It's not even agreeing with the facts, saying like, well, I think these things are true. It is to rest upon them ourselves, to personally believe. And I think for a lot of us, it's good to go back to the basics on this. Because I think we, a lot of us get tied up in 
in knowledge-based Bible study. A lot of us get wrapped up in scripture memorization. Uh, we and These are good things, but we want to be careful to treat the Word for what it is, God's divine revelation given to us that we might know Him. Not just know about Him, and not just know about this, but that we would know Him. So that when we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, we are not just saying that I agree with facts about God that are distilled in a a list of propositions, but that I know Him. I trust Him. I believe Him. I love my God. So, as we're considering the Apostles' Creed, And we're going to run through these various propositions about who God is, our Trinitarian God, our triune God. Ask yourself, do I believe? Or do you merely agree? Is it something that you've been taught? Is it something that you've you've come to buy into? Or do you actually believe today? You see that, that... That's the essence of faith, right? The Christian life. Like, to depend on Christ. We are a word-driven people because this is where we get the knowledge of Christ. We don't worship the book. We worship the God who is revealed in the book. Without the book, no real knowledge of God. But it should always lead us to worship. It doesn't end with the book. It ends in this communion that we're designed to have with our maker. The Christian life starts and ends with belief, with faith. So evaluate yourself and determine, have I begun with faith? Maybe I began the Christian life with faith. And am I slipping into something else? Something that Paul talks quite a bit about in Galatians. That sometimes you begin by faith, but you slip into a works model of righteousness. Meaning, we understand that a person is saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. God's mercy directed towards us. We receive that by faith, the open arms of faith. We don't work for it or earn it. But then as Christians, oftentimes we begin to rely less on Jesus and we begin to rely more on what we do to feel accepted by God, to feel good about our relationship with God. And this is the danger that we want to avoid. There's no danger in pursuing godliness. There's no danger in fighting sin. There's no danger in trying or struggling or striving. Those are good things. But when you begin to trust what you do and rely on what you do as the basis of your relationship with God instead of Christ, then you are losing your grip on the gospel. God won't lose his grip on you, but you can lose your grip on him. So that's why we return to this again and again. We are saved by grace through faith, and this faith is fundamentally trust.